Hello, uh, a warm welcome everyone to the Mill Road History Society talk, which is entitled Military Town and Gown of Mill Road, Two Wartime Veterans of the Cambridgeshire Regiment. It is being given this evening by Robin James, who for the past 30 years has worked at the Cambridge University Library and is a chartered academic librarian. So please welcome Robin James. Well, good evening, Ron. Let me just share my screen and we can get going. Marvellous. Um, well, first, I'll kick us off with a, a very short apology because my notes are on my second screen, which is below my camera. So my apologies, I'll probably be looking down for most of the time um, as I read my notes. But uh, um, as long as you can see the slides, I'm, I'm much less important, I think, than, than the slides. Um, so as Robin said, my name is Robin James. Um, and I'm going to talk to you tonight about two men who both served with the Cambridgeshire Regiment um, and for uh, who for several different reasons will fall into the category uh, of your area of interest. Um, and uh, as Robin said, happy to take questions at the end um, and uh, I hope you enjoy the presentation. So, to kick us off, who, who am I? Um, just a little bit about me personally. Um, and I hope this will provide a little bit of context to the evening. So I was born locally and brought up in and around Cambridge. My grandparents who were on the screen owned a shop in Sleaford Street, so fairly close to Mill Road, um, which although it's not there now, uh, may have been known to, to some of you. Um, their names were Bob and Edna Wingrove. Um, and uh, unsurprisingly, the, the shop was called Wingroves with an apostrophe. Um, my grandfather also owned uh, the um, betting shop that was between Wingroves and the Gelgart pub, both uh, long since gone now. Uh, my, my grandparents retired in the 80s um, and, uh, and the shop has since, I think, been turned into a house and, and, and everything's gone. But that's a little bit about me. Um, I've also, as Robin said, I've worked for Cambridge University Library for pushing 30 years now, which is where I met Robin. And I noticed a couple of other familiar names on, on tonight's talk, which is nice, so nice to see you. Um, and alongside this, in the late 90s, I also served in the Royal Anglian Regiment in D Cambridgeshire Company of the 6th Battalion Royal Anglian Regiment, um, operating out of the TA Centre in Coldham's Lane. Um, the Cambridgeshire Regiment is the forebear of D Company, um, and I realised when I when I joined D Company, I became interested in their history, uh, and realised that I could spend my coffee breaks, my lunch time, any spare time I had at work, uh, researching the history of the regiment, um, and that's that's what I did. Um, and I also co-own a research website with a couple of friends who were doing the same sort of research, and that website. Is the, uh, is the result of, of essentially of 30 years of work from, from three of us. Uh, I will put up the website address at the end of the presentation today. So if you want to know more about the regiment itself, the battles it took part in, uh, please, please do go and, go and have a look. Um, we have uh, a large photographic database. We have things like casualty lists, nominal roles, uh, medal rolls and things like that. Um, it's a non-profit making website and we're happy to take inquiries from anyone who might have an interest in the Cambridgeshire Regiment or any descendants who may have served in the regiment, so please do get in touch. Um, so, although tonight we're going to talk a bit about two men, specifically about two men who served in the regiment and both uh, in France during the First World War, I thought it might be useful to give you a whistle-stop tour of the local infantry, regiment, infantry regiment's history. Now, depending on your view, the regiment has two histories. Um, there was the 30th Cambridgeshire Regiment of Foot, uh, which fought with distinction during the Peninsular Wars uh, at Waterloo and in the Crimean Campaign. In 1881, it was amalgamated with the 59th Foot to form the East Lancashire Regiment. Now, my own experience from researching that unit as well um, is that men of the 30th were very rarely recruited in and around Cambridgeshire. So the link to that regiment really is in name only. Um, the majority of their recruiting seems to take place in Ireland. So 
Loc locally, there was a militia. The lineage really starts in 1860 when the Rifle Volunteer Force was created with companies at various major towns across the county. And on the screen is a photo shown bottom right. Um, in 1887, this became the third volunteer battalion of the Suffolk Regiment and was much more like the Territorial Army of today with weekly drill nights and annual camps. Um, and during the Boer War, a detachment of men from the 3rd Volunteer Battalion volunteered for service and served in South Africa, earning the regiment's first battle honour and campaign medals. The detachment that went is shown in the photograph top right, which is, I think, a really rather nice photograph, um, capturing the men just before they went, went to, to Africa. Um, like other regiments, the Cambridgeshires have been affected by the constant restructuring of the army. So in 1908, there was further change when the regiment briefly became the Cambridgeshire Battalion, the Suffolk Regiment at TF, but a year later it finally became the 1st Battalion, the Cambridgeshire Regiment. And it was under this designation that it fought during the First World War. The regiment was almost disbanded after World War I, like lots of other territorial units, but the efforts of the men and officers, including the two we'll talk about tonight, allowed it to continue and remain viable during the hard interwar years. In 1919, 1939, with war inevitable, a second battalion was raised, but the regiment sub subsequently suffered substantial losses after both battalions were captured at Singapore and held prisoner of war for over three years. In 1947, the regiment was converted to an artillery role, becoming the 629 Light Anti-Aircraft Regiment Royal Artillery, the Cambridgeshire Regiment, um, and then assumed an airborne role but in 1956, the regiment returned to its traditional role and designation as the 1st Battalion of the Cambridgeshire Regiment. There was a general reduction in the size of the Territorial Army in 1961, and the 1st Cambridgeshire were amalgamated with the 4th Battalion of the Suffolk Regiment to become the Suffolk and Cambridgeshire Regiment TA, until 1971, when the lineage passed to D Company of 6th Royal Anglian, and then, unusually, to D Company 5 Royal Anglian, and then back to D Company 6 Royal Anglian again uh, a couple of years later, which was during my time with the regiment in the late 90s, disbanding in 1999. A D Company 1 Royal Anglian now has the designation of the Cambridgeshire Company, but the territorial volunteer lineage ended in 1999 when 6 Royal Anglian was disbanded. Um, I mentioned the territorial force briefly when talking about the regimental history, but we'll say a little bit more about it now. The Territorial Force was created in 1908, when the 3rd Volunteer Battalion Suffolk Regiment became the 1st Battalion Cambridgeshire Regiment. This was unusual because there were no regular battalion in the county, so unlike almost all other infantry regiments where the territorial units typically are the 4th, 5th, 6th and so on, in the Cambridgeshire's, the Territorial Battalion is the 1st Battalion. It's very unusual. Uh, there are only three other regiments uh, in, the, in the Army at that time, uh, who had this distinction, the Herefordshires, the Hertfordshires, and the Monmouthshires. The fact that the Cambridgeshires have always been territorial has been an immense source of pride over its history until it was disbanded in 1999. In early 1914, the Cambridgeshire Regiment was made up of eight companies and an HQ, as you can see from the slide. They were fairly well spread across the county. A recruiting drive in early 1914, as a result of the growing unrest and threats of war in Europe, resulted in the battalion being almost at full strength, so about 900 men, although many were technically underage, joining as buglers and drummers or, or simply falsifying their dates of birth in order to enlist. So where do our two men fit in? Um, the first man I'd like to talk about tonight is George Brimley Bowes. He was born in 1874, uh, the son of Robert and Fanny Bowes, and she was Brimley before she was Bowes. Um, his father, Robert, established Bowes Bookselling and Publishing Company. The shop was at 1 Trinity Street and is now what we know as the CUP Bookshop. And that site is thought to be the oldest continuous, continuously cited bookshop in the country. Uh, Robert was also an officer in the Rifle Volunteer Corps in the 1870s, and he and George were one of a large number of father, son or other family combinations to serve with the local regiment. He was educated locally at the Perth School, where he later became the Chair of Governors between 1921 and 1931. And after the Perth, he came up to Emmanuel College in 1892 to read classics, graduating in 1895. And the photograph shown of George as an undergraduate on the left of the screen 
is reproduced here with, with kind permission of Emmanuel College. He appears in their files as a rugby, rugby nines player and a member of the college's classics society. And whilst a student, he also served in the University Rifle Volunteers from 1893 to 1897 and commissioned in January 1897 into the 3rd Volunteer Battalion of the Suffolk Regiment, which was for him the local territorial infantry regiment at that time. But I mentioned the history of the company, and this is in part down to their location, being at 1 Trinity Street, at the very centre of the city and the university, directly opposite the Senate House, uh, and it's remembered for a scene in 1897, shown on the right, uh, when, at the, when at the time of a vote to consider granting degrees to women, an effigy of a woman on a bicycle was suspended out of the window of the bookshop. Um, it's probable that George was there that day, um, either in the shop or, or just casting his vote, possibly maybe in the crowd below. Uh, the resolution didn't pass and women didn't receive degrees until 1921 without privileges on equal terms as late as 1947. But we can see the prominence of, of the Bose bookshop. Um, as previously mentioned, though, it is thought to be the oldest bookshop in the country, originating in 1581 um, and, and have been owned by various publishers uh, and firms, including Bose and Bowes, before becoming the CUP bookshop in the later half of the 20th century. Uh, very uh, central building. So George Brimley Bowes received his lieutenancy in 1989 and became a partner in his family business in 1989, sorry, 1899. Um, and although it didn't change its name to Bowes and Bowes, uh, rather it didn't change its name to Bowes and Bowes until 1907. He received his captaincy in December of 1905 and became the officer commanding B Company in January 1906. In the 1911 census, he's listed as being single and still living with his parents at 13 Park Terrace, a rather splendid terrace overlooking Parker's Peace, and married later that year to Christine Robinette Scrooby of Shaftesbury Road, Cambridge. He was promoted to Major in 1914 and became the Senior Major of the 2nd 1st Battalion in February 15, when the 1st Battalion sailed to France. He then commanded the 62nd Provisional Battalion from June to October 1915, and the 67th Provisional Battalion was a home-based unit undertaking guard and other duties locally. Now in the photograph shown, George is one in from the right, um, and I suspect, I hope anyway, that there's a certain amount of foreshortening in this photograph, because the two chaps on the extreme right-hand side of that line look incredibly small compared to the chap uh, uh, closest to the camera. Um, We'll see a close-up of that photo uh, in a moment. So here we are. Um, on the right is, is the enlargement of that photo. Um, despite commanding the 67th Provisional Battalion, George volunteered for overseas service in August of 1915. The battalion had been out in France since February. In September of that year, he was awarded the Territorial Decoration for 20 years service. And this is a less often seen medal with the regiment. They only received 11 awards. So they only had 11 officers who served 20 years or more during the period of the Cambridgeshire Regiment. Um, and George now joined the battalion in France in November 1916, uh, aged 42. Now, it appears that he may not have been very suited to the rigors of French warfare. It was, very, it was a very challenging environment for the older territorial officers. Uh, we, we see this from our research that uh, the men were in their 40s. They were used to a very particular type of warfare um, and or at least e exercising and practicing. In reality, it turned out to be very different. Um, and there's a note in the, in the battalion papers that they hoped that Major Bowes would be offered a town, major, a town major's post uh, and therefore removed somewhat from the front line. Um, in December 1916, he's accidentally wounded whilst observing some hand grenade throwing practice. A group of officers are standing behind an earth bank, um, watching some other ranks throwing live hand grenades. Uh, and they bend down into the cover of the bank each time one of the grenades explodes. Now, regrettably, George has positioned himself behind a section of the bank, which is lower than the rest of the bank. So, um, Despite bending down, he's struck by fragments of the grenade when it explodes. And an investigation is carried out, which concludes that 
this may have been deliberately self-inflicted uh, and he's therefore court-martialed. Um, it was quite common during World War I for soldiers to deliberately wound themselves to avoid service uh, on the front line. And George is found guilty by the court, although it obliquely suggests incompetence rather than premeditation. Um, and I think, to be fair, I suspect it's, this probably is the case. Uh, I think it would be very difficult, given the random way a hand grenade explodes, to guarantee a minor wound as opposed to a lethal one. Um, and we can see from the date of the court martial, two days after his wounding, that it can't have been an especially serious wound. He is nonetheless found guilty um, and severely reprimanded. Um, it should be noted that in his statement, he takes the blame wholly upon himself, suggesting that the grenade thrower and the NCO supervising the exercise bear no responsibility. And this almost certainly contributes to the outcome, chivalrous as it is. Um, so the outcome of the court martial suggests that George wasn't really a natural soldier. After all, he was a publisher and a businessman in civilian life. He was subsequently moved to a more rear echelon role and, among other things, chaired the 18 core committee of the management at Talbot House in Popperinge in 1917. Uh, Talbot House is a cafe, come B&B, &B, come chapel, uh, in the small town of Popperinge near Ypres, and it provided a sanctuary for troops regardless of their rank uh, and was a fond memory of many men who fought on the Western Front and was known by the phonetic shortening of TOC H by most. He was then seconded to the Labour Corps in early 1918. Uh, this unit was largely made up of men whose health was too poor to, for fighting and often included men who had been wounded earlier in the war and it undertook various non-combat or rear echelon roles along the Western Front. On the 21st of March 1918, the Germans launched the Spring Offensive. It was aimed at breaking the Allied lines and winning the war before the huge influx of American troops later that year. It was essentially a last-ditch last attempt to break the stalemate, and it overwhelmed the front lines in many places and led to the capture of thousands of Allied soldiers, and, but also their heroic defence and rearguard actions, but it ultimately wasn't successful. The Cambridgeshire Regiment were heavily involved and the fighting was intense with, the resistance, with resistance and then shoring up of defences, with the leaders playing an absolutely crucial role. One of those leaders was Major Few, who describes in his papers an encounter, and, and I'm quoting here, um, the one and only G.B. Bowes was on the 29th of March 1918, when in charge of a company of clerks and whatnots marching west, and he did not like it when I ordered him to face about and dig in. Now, there's no suggestion that Bose didn't follow these orders. Um, so although perhaps unwillingly, he did play a part in the defense of the line, which ultimately stopped the German advance and contributed to the eventual Allied victory. For his service to his country, I should have said on the previous slide, um, the, the bottom left-hand photograph is the is a is on the flyleaf of, of a copy of the regimental history that I bought many years ago, which happened by chance to have been given by George Bowes to Tubby, uh, Tubby Clayton, who was the co-founder of Top H, and he made this rather nice uh, dedication to him in, in, in the book itself. Um, so just to pop that on the slide. Um, so for his service to his country in peace and war, George was awarded an unusual combination of medals. He received the British War and Victory Medal for his service in 1916, 17, 18, which are standard First World War campaign medals. But he also received a rare Territorial Force War Medal, which was awarded to those men of all ranks who volunteered for overseas, overseas service in 1914 or 15, but who were not used overseas um, and were therefore not awarded the 1914 or 1915 star. Um, there were only five such awards to the officers of the Cambridge Regiment. And when coupled with his territorial decoration for long service, it's a unique combination of medals to the regiment. And the medals shown in the photograph are George's actual medals, but alas, the British War and Victory medals are missing from the group. So George retired from the army in December 1920, when he reached the maximum length of service, but he remained a very active member of the newly created Old Comrades Association and helped champion the cause of the ex-servicemen attending, attending functions and parades to support the men of his old unit. His address at that time was 40 Lindsfield Road. He supported many worthy causes in Cambridge, many involving support for children 
and teachers such as the Boys Brigade, sorry, teenagers such as the Boys Brigade, but others aimed at philanthropy more generally. In 1922, with another Cambridgeshire Regiment officer, a Major Peck, he founded the Cambridge Rotary Club, which still exists today, uh, becoming their second president, succeeding Major Peck, who was the first president, and actively raising money for local community projects. He was also extremely active in the publishing sphere, sitting on various committees, chairing various trade associations, and was the excursion secretary for the Cambridge Antiquarian Society. He died on the 7th of December 1946, living at that time at 21 Newton Road, which is just off Trumpington Road near Brooklands Avenue. He was aged 72. His funeral was held at the Church of St Edward on Pease Hill, right in the centre of Cambridge, with many mourners from the publishing industry and from the Cambridgeshire Regiment. And he was buried alongside his parents in Mill Road Cemetery. And I hope the Mill Road Cemetery, uh, I hope the um, Mill Road Cemetery people won't mind me borrowing their photograph for this, um, this presentation. So in the bottom right hand corner is the, is the uh, Bowes family graves. Um, and the, the photograph on the left hand side of this page is the Cambridgeshire Regimental History for the First World War, which was published in 1934 by Bowes and Bowes. Um, uh, it's a very splendid publication um, and it's interesting because Bows and Bows published a number of publications about the regiment uh, and, and of course uh, um, the influence there was, was George Brimley Bows, uh, who obviously was able to do that as part of his normal work. You can see also he wrote the introduction to the regimental history which is, which is, very, which is a very readable text if, if uh, available as a reprint nowadays if anyone would like to get hold of that. So, so that's George Brimley Bowes, um, who, who started uh, uh, not in the Millwood area, but finished in the Millwood area. And then we come on to John Summers Mansfield. Summers Mansfield. Um, when I recently got in touch with the David Parr House team, they referred to him as Jack. Um, but in all the military research I've done, he's been John. Um, but I think we could easily go with either. But for the purposes of today, I'll stay with the, uh, with the John that I've known him as. Uh, during my research. Uh, he was born in Cambridge in 1882 and grew up in the Romsey town area. His parents were Alfred and Mary Mansfield. He joined the army in 1900 and at this point it would have been the 3rd Volunteer Battalion the Suffolk Regiment. And interestingly they had a small detachment serving in South African Boer War so it's possible that he responded to recruiting drives based on that campaign. Probably due to his age and the timing he didn't serve overseas at that point. When the 1901 census was done, he was living in Parsonage Street off the city end of Newmarket Road and was working for the Star Brewery, also on Newmarket Road, uh, and, and then also as a grocer's assistant. The regiment landed in France in 1915 when John was a sergeant. But John was married in 1908 to Mary Emma Parr, the daughter of David Parr, and was promoted to corporal the following year. It's interesting to note that at this time he was in B Company, which was commanded by Captain Bowes, so the two men would have known each other despite their uh, diff different upbringings, they were serving together in the, same, in the same company. In 1912, Mansfield was awarded the first of his medals, his Territorial Force Efficiency Medal, for 12 years long service. And you will, will recall that George Bowes only volunteered for Imperial service in August of 1915. Mansfield had volunteered when the regiment were first asked, in late 1914. Um, and as such, he was present when the regiment entrained en masse at Cambridge Railway Station and travelled down to the south coast for the journey across to France. And the first battalion landed on the 14th of February 1915. Now, Mansfield isn't mentioned in the battalion war diary very many times. Uh, very few other ranks are mentioned in the regimental war diaries. Um, but we know that he served overseas continuously from 1915 through to 1919. He would have had a couple of periods of, of um, leave when he might have come back to the UK, but they would only have been a week or two at the most. He served the full four years in, in, in France. Now, broadly speaking, the Cambridgeshire Regiment took part in two major actions each year, although they were in and out of the line in the Somme or around Ypres almost, at almost weekly intervals. As a sergeant and a colour sergeant, he would most likely have been leading men in action. In 1915, the regiment experiences its first action, working under fire 
both artillery and sniper fire, and the first fatal casualty was a corporal from Cambridge who had served before the war with John. That was March, but in May the battalion was being rotated into the front line for the first time when a large mine detonated beneath the trenches and the enemy attacked. The Cambridges were in the thick of the action and helped repulse the enemy, although men were injured and killed. Then in May, the battalion was moved uh, the battalion was, hang on a sec, then in May the battalion was involved in an action in Foss Wood, where they were caught out in the open and in Foss Wood itself and shelled ferociously by the German army. In 1916, the battalion were involved in two large scale actions. They captured the German stronghold called the Schwaben Redoubt, which is on the Somme near Thietval, in October, after many failed attempts by other regiments. And shortly after that, the capture of the village of St. Pierre Divion. Um, now, this, this, the picture on the slide is, is around the Schwaben Redoubt, not the Schwaben Redoubt because it's a slight rise, but, but, but close by. Um, and they, after capturing the Schwaben Redoubt, they rolled down the hill uh, to then capture the village of St. Pierre de Vion, um, closer to the Onca Valley. Then in July, the Battle of St. In, in July 1917, the Battle of St. Julian near Ypres and the Battle of Tower Hamlets Ridge in November. And as previously mentioned in George Bose's section, in March of 1918, the Cambridges were involved in the German Spring Offensive. And at some point between landing in France and the summer of 1918, John moved across to the quartermaster section of the company and may possibly even have been with them the whole time. And although the Cambridge Regiment was an infantry regiment, they still need to be fed, clothed um, and equipped with weapons and ammunition. And this is all done by the QM branch. Uh, and in the trenches of World War I, this was an incredibly complex thing. Getting a daily hot meal to 900 to 1,000 men usually involved cooking it some distance behind the lines and then man packing it up to the frontline trenches for distribution. And during large battles, this would often mean having to find your company or your battalion, often under fire and occasionally in the dark, in fact, probably often in the dark. It was a dangerous but essential business. And the support trenches were often shelled because men were less protected in those uh, than the frontline trenches and the men's health and morale depended on these daily supply lines. So the timeline so far takes us up to the middle of 1918 and heading towards what are known as the last 100 days when the army were involved in major actions almost daily as they pushed the German army back towards the Hindenburg line. There are various battles but the one we're now interested in is for the village of Epey, east of Peron, and the picture shown is Epey uh, in 1918. Uh, it was in total ruins after having exchange, been changed hands a couple of times during the war. Uh, it was uh, held by the British, overrun, then held by the Germans, and it, it switched a couple of times. Each time uh, it got destroyed a little bit more. Um, it, so as you can see, in complete ruins, a network of fortified bunkers and tunnels and the Cambridges were on a divisional flank. So in fact, there were men from three different divisions involved in the attacks, so the potential for confusion was quite high. Of the two tanks allocated for the attack, one broke down before it arrived and the other was knocked out minutes after the advance started. So for the rest of the battle, it was just the infantry with supporting artillery. It was an extremely tough battle and two of the assaulting battalions bypassed the village by accident, leaving the Cambridges in a very difficult position. And soon, all the officers who were leading from the front became casualties, and NCOs were leading the companies. By nightfall, the fighting had died down, but the battle was by no means won. Um, and under cover of the darkness, the Cambridges took stock of their losses and brought up supplies. Those supplies were brought up by Mansfield and his team. And as you can see from his DCM citation shown on the slide, he found the company with no officers and very disorganized. And rather than head back, he assumed command of the company, staying for the following day's action, reorganizing and leading the men during a very challenging day during which under constant enemy barrage, a foothold in the German line was finally made and until the officers from the battle surplus could be brought forward. And as mentioned for his gallantry and leadership, uh, company quartermaster Sergeant Mansfield was awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal which at that time was the next award down from the Victoria Cross and one of only 32 awarded to the Cambridge Regiment. Um, the battalion was in action again in October at Orby and was preparing for further action when the armistice was signed on the 11th of November. Uh, 
that I should just go back and read the citation. So a payee on the 19th of September 1918, on arriving at company headquarters with rations, he found that the company was badly disorganized, having lost all its officers. He remained with the company for the next 24 hours and succeeded in thoroughly reorganizing it under very heavy shell fire. Later, under heavy fire, he gallantly led his ration party up to a captured position. Um, after the armistice was signed, there was still a lot of work to do, a con containing the defeated German army, um, undertaking salvage from the battlefields uh, and burying the dead. So the Cambridge Regiment remained in France uh, beyond the war. In January 1919, Mansfield was awarded the Meritorious Service Medal, a rare award made usually to the logistics and supply elements of a battalion for outstanding service. Only eight such awards were made to the Cambridge Regiment, and this is the only award, award to a recipient of the DCM. Uh, demobilisation started in early 1919, with men gradually being returned to the UK. And by May, there was only a cadre of about 50 men, and Mansfield was part of this group. He was one of a group within this cadre of about eight to ten other men, including the now commanding officer, uh, Colonel Clayton, who had landed in France four years before, served for the duration of the war and still been there on the last day when the battalion boarded the trains with the regimental colours to return to the UK. The cadre returned to Cambridge by train, arriving on the 21st of May to a great cheering reception at the station, which I think you can just see in the back of the photograph on the page there, the, the archways of the, of the station. Um, where they were met, where the colours were met and inspected by the Lord Lieutenant, Mr. Aideen, and afterwards his wife tied victory laurel wreaths to both colours, as you can see in the photograph. The cadre then formed up and followed by many former comrades, marched through the city and through King's College, up Queen's Road, down Burrell's Walk to the Eastern General Hospital, now the site of the University Library, and where a lunch had been arranged. Uh, Acting Company Sergeant Major, uh, Mansfield was disembodied a few weeks later in June. Um, now you might be surprised to hear that although ribbons of medals were distributed to the soldiers almost straight after the war, and in some cases for decorations of gallantry they were distributed immediately, the medals themselves were not often awarded for some years. And this photograph taken on Parker's piece in October 1919 is when John Mansfield was awarded both his DCM and his MSM. Uh, and the sharp-eyed among you will be to pick him out in the centre of the photo wearing a bowler hat. Uh, the campaign medals the men were entitled to were often not issued until 1922. Now you can just see the, the row of houses behind. The police station would be on the extreme right hand of this picture. That terrace is still there. Um, and behind the gentleman standing leaning against his cane would have been Park Terrace, where uh, George Rumi Bowes uh, had lived at one point. Um, so here's that photo again on the right hand side, um, enlarged, you can clearly see, uh, see um, John now. And also shown as a screen grab from the David Parr House website, uh, I hope they won't mind me borrowing that for today. Um, it shows John, his daughter Elsie and his wife Mary walking along I think what looks to be a seafront. Um, and this relaxed scene is a superb contrast to the uniform military photos that I've, I've had of him. The caption from Elsie is that she remembers her father coming home from work smelling of gas. And this is because he was a fitter's mate at the Gasworks, which was located where the Tesco's now is off Newmarket Road. Now, many of you will be aware that John's wife Mary was David Parr's daughter, and a teenage Elsie moved into 186 Gwider Street with her widowed grandmother and lived there for the next 85 years, preserving the house. Uh, I only discovered this connection recently. Um, uh, when I got in touch with Robin Mansfield, who I should add isn't a relative of John's, um, but I was asking him if he was, and it turns out he wasn't, um, but he did say, is that the connection to David Parr House, which has led to this talk. Um, so, so I think that typifies what I love about local research, both military and civilian. Um, I have to say, I especially like researching local territorial army soldiers, because their civilian lives can be as interesting as their military ones. Um, and, and obviously this history has occurred on the streets that we're still walking down every day. Uh, and here's just a rather nice photo of John taken at the 1921 camp holding one of the regimental colours. And you can see he's resplendent in his medals there, which is rather nice. Um, and the post-war post years, as previously mentioned, were a very challenging time for the Territorial Army. And in Cambridge, it was no different. There were millions of men returning from the war and times were very hard. Uh, the army was being significantly downsized, not unreasonably, and many felt there was no need for territorial soldiers. 
In Cambridge, there was a core of men, both officers and NCOs, who worked utterly tirelessly to ensure the survival of the unit, and John Mansfield was among them. And during the 1920s, he became the regimental quartermaster sergeant and served a total of 32 years uh, with the regiment, retiring in 1932. He was awarded fir a first and a second bar to his Territorial Force Efficiency Medal. That's on the far right of the picture you can see there. Um, but one of only two men in the regiment to achieve that distinction. His medal group shown on the slide is exceptional. As mentioned previously, the Cambridgeshire Regiment received only 32 awards of the Distinguished Conduct Medal, which is the one on the extreme left, um, and only eight of the Meritorious Service Medal, which is the silver medal with the maroon and white ribbon. Um, and he is the only person to receive both of those. And then adding his triple long service award just reinforces what a remarkable and dedicated Territorial Army career he had. And the medal group is the physical embodiment of that career. Now, I have no research to show whether John volunteered for home service during World War II. Um, he isn't known to have been Home Guard or ARP, but he would have been almost 60 by, the, by this time, although that didn't preclude service in, in either of those bodies. Um, the next reference I have to him is his death in 1946, some 11 months before George Bowes, by coincidence, but the same year. He was quite young at 64, and his funeral took place in Christchurch on Newmarket Road, close to his previous home in Parsonage Street, and to both the gasworks and the brewery where he'd worked most of his life, and he's buried in the graveyard there. And on a personal note, I was disappointed to find very little notification of John's death in the local papers, uh, just a simple note from the family. Uh, and I have to say, I'm constantly surprised that these men who endured the war to end all wars uh, and who were, and who were recognised for their gallantry are not written about in later years. Uh, it may be, of course, that they would have preferred it this way, as many chose not to talk about their time uh, and often felt guilty at having been singled out when so many others weren't. So to bring the presentation to a conclusion, uh, we've seen two very different men who typify the notion of town and gown, um, one who was born in the Milroyd area uh, and the other who finished up in the Milroyd area, um, but who both lived their whole lives in the city. And I hope you found this brief talk on two local characters interesting and thank you for inviting me to speak. Thank you very much. Um, so perhaps, but, yeah. just to say there's a slide there with a link to our website. Um, I'm happy to take questions, but if you'd like more information on the Cambridgeshire Regiment and to look at their history, the campaigns and the men in greater detail, please do have a look at our website um, and feel free to get in touch if you think you might have information you can contribute. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Robin. It's very, very interesting. Right, so I'll just read out a few of the uh, comments we've got. Um, so uh, Helen, um, Helen Weinstein, who uh, runs a, um, uh, a research project around the Sleaford Street area, says that uh, they, the elders in the area do, that she's talked to do remember the shop well. And she's a photo of the betting shop that's recently found by a local family, which she can share with you if you're interested. Oh, yeah, I'd be really interested in that, yeah. I I, I once read also that the um, there used to be a post box embedded in the wall um, between there, and I, I once read that that was the oldest post box in Cambridge, but I don't know whether that was ever true. But it was a Victorian, uh, it had the V the V cipher on it, so uh, I wonder where wonder where that went. Mm. Yeah, yes, Robin, I can share that with you. I think the the post box might have been opposite on the corner, um, on the on the on the corner opposite the Geldart, but the photo, which is rather charming might have a member of your family in it next to the window. Yeah, thank you. Because be there used to be a little shop on Ainsworth Street run by the Tooks, which was probably rather similar to the Wingrove store. Okay. Um, and had supply people with gas as well as the gas. The people used to run a lot of their heating with those gas cylinders and things. So there would be local colour gas deliveries, which apparently the Wingroves did as well and as well as groceries and then the little betting shop of course just got a charming photograph of grandfather took in his coat in his brown coat that he would have um worn to to his own shop um going in to make, to, to make a bet with a few other elders sitting on 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 uh, a little bench outside kind of waiting and passing the time that's fascinating i mean i i, I was about 12 or well, probably about 10 when my grandparents gave the shop up when when they retired and moved across to Arbury but I remember I remember going in the shop and you could get to the betting shop from behind they were joined up behind so um, yeah some fond memories of running about and, and being in the back back of the back of the shop 
so they're well, it's fascinating. Yeah, and at some time, if you'd like to come to the neighbourhood, we've done a blue plaque project. So we've we've mm. covered um, two streets so far. So about 130 houses have got blue plaques up now, and we have found some quite interesting regimental stories. We're not sure how many of them are Cambridgeshire regiment. Uh, it's a bit of a mix, but it might be nice maybe when we're a bit further on with our project. And yeah, definitely. Four streets rather than just the two, which we will have done by the autumn. We will have got up to there that maybe we could kind of bring together all the regimental stories and you could yeah, have a fascinating I'd, I'd love to love to help wherever I can with that. that that would be great for example there's quite an interesting story from Sturton Street from the Laurie family of uh, of the father from that family who's a, who runs the mangle for the laundry because he was blinded in the trenches in the Crimean war so that's a very early story so oh, thank you just thank you for such a fascinating talk that was oh, a really good introduction Appreciate it. Thank you. So, uh, Helen, if you, if you send that photo on to me, I'll forward it on to Robin. Um, Marvellous. That'd be easy Thank you. Play, um, okay, that's great. So, uh, there's a comment from Caro that um, there was on the Bows and Bows site, um, the earlier book, an earlier bookshop was uh, founded by Daniel Macmillan, who founded Macmillan mm -hmm. Publishing and is buried in the Red Cemetery. So, uh, you know, for people who didn't know that. Um, and Caro also asks that if if George hadn't pleaded guilty um, to the uh, the grenade incident um, being his fault, um, would the man who threw the hand grenade in, in, himself been court-martialed instead? I very much doubt it. Uh, live firing is live firing, and frankly, if you if you're watching it, you know hand grenades blow up in an incredibly random way um, by design. I I very much doubt they they. I think they were following all the safety protocols and. And George wasn't, so I think, in all probability, his confession was probably a, a moot point in, in oh, right. respects. I guess uh, it didn't actually make a difference in the end. But probably. I don't. I, yeah, from reading his it, it, the, the the transcripts of the court martial are in his service papers at the PRO um, or National Archives, um, and um, and looking at it, I, I don't think so. Um, there, there are clear statements from the thrower and the NCO, and and they point towards the safety protocols being followed. So pro probably not. Okay, all right. It have been a stain. Would it have been considered a stain on his character or not? I, th I think it probably would. Um, yes. it's, it's a very difficult thing because one, one doesn't really want to besmirch the characters of, of people no. who don't have the opportunity to defend themselves. But equally, one doesn't want to hero worship people you know, for the sake of it. And I think in all, the evidence points towards him being not particularly well liked amongst the other officers. Um, yes. Uh, but, but he clearly was a, a philanthropist. He clearly, his heart was clearly in the right place. But mm. I, I don't think an infantry regiment was the place for him. In all honesty, mm. um, it's a particular type of of work, and not everyone is suited to it. Mm. Thank you. Um, so there's a comment from uh, from the other Robin who says he spotted his great uncle, Sergeant Robert Maxin, in two of the photos. And was certainly yeah. <laughs> And uh, the, he was gassed during the war and went back to the front after recuperating. That's that's quite <laughs> wild. Yeah, the Cambridges um, were right on the very edge of the first uh, use of poison gas. Um, they just avoided that, but they were subjected to um, a crude form of tear gas on on a number of occasions during 1915, and then later by by the phosgene later in the war. So yeah, that's quite probable. Um, and there's a comment from Jeff Ding. Uh, Jeff, I don't quite follow what it, what it is you're writing there. Do you want to just um, tell us what about what it is you're writing? What you've got, you put down there about Harold? Yes, Harold is his son, John Mansfield's son. All right. His younger son. Born. He's born 1917, and his middle name is St Julian. And that was one of the battles that his father it was. was in. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Oh, I would see. Named after the battle. Mm. It's, it's an interesting one because um, lots of people regard the Schwaben Redoubt as the Cambridge's greatest um, achievement, but I think the men themselves regard St Julian as one of the greatest achievements. Uh, if you if you read the um, dedications that are that are produced on um, by a reunion, so typically if you go into the local papers at uh, nineteen twenty six, seven, and eight. And in 1930, six, seven, and eight, 
typically the reflection on St Julian is 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 far greater than on the on the Schwab Redoubt. So yeah, it was like it was a, another complex battle, um, which 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 had very little cover and 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 I think there was a rear guard action fought during that one as well. So I'm, I'm I have to confess I'm not totally surprised by that, but it's that's a really nice thing to to hear. Mm. Okay, um, that's all the comments we've got down in the uh, uh, in the chat. So, does it, does anyone else have anything they'd like to ask or, or to add? <laughs> I do. Ahead, I'm sorry, I've got one more. Really, when um, John assumed command that time, would he have been the most senior person there, and would he have known he was, or would it just have been a kind of act of gallantry, act of bravery? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, Almost certainly not all of the officers would have been, they would have been incapacitated through wounds, but not necessarily all killed. So it's possible there were officers there who were not mobile or not able to contribute in that sense. Um, there may well have been other senior ranking NCOs around, but of course the thing about the thing about gallantry is it pops up from nowhere um, and comes in sometimes in the most unlikely places. So it may be that there were other NCOs there who who didn't see the gravity of the situation or didn't react in the same way. So I, it's not very easy to say, really. Um, there were other NCOs awarded uh, for action that day. So I think there were three or four Distinguished Conduct Medals for that action. Um, but of course, there were also four companies in action as well. So yeah, I, I don't think our information really shows which which men were from which company, but um, my guess is that probably he got there and he thought, oh, I just need to do something, um, and and he and he did. Um, so, so but, but but you know he wasn't alone in that. There were other people doing similar things, but out of you know nine hundred to a thousand men, um, it made lots of gallantry goes unnoticed, unfortunately. But um, he obviously was singled out. Um, so I, I suspect he was probably the one person making the decisions, organising the men and calming an extremely difficult situation down. Isn't that impressive? I think so, yeah. Mm. I think it's I think it's absolutely uh, amazing, really. Mm. Mm. Can I make a comment uh, on Robert Maxing, my great uncle? Uh, he was involved with the Cambridgeshire Regiment, as, I, as I've said. He also went on uh, with the Territorial Army in Cambridge and uh, you, you spoke about booglers, gigglers earlier, and uh, my father followed his uncle into the territorials, and my father was a bugler as well, and uh, he was taught that, and uh, uh, I think I think they had pickaxe and handles at the beginning of the Second World War to uh, uh, pretend they were they were um, rifles, um, yeah, uh, and. When Great Uncle Bob was dying, he was there somewhere. Great Uncle Bob was dying. He he relived a lot of his battles yeah. in, in in his uh, nasty dreams and things like that. My father was with him, and uh, it was pretty nasty. But there we go. Yeah, Thanks I think there was a, I think there was a horrible legacy of, of that type of thing, especially with men who didn't talk about it often for the for the rest of their lives. Um, but what you say, Robin, is really interesting because buglers were often underage soldiers by any other description, um, essentially shoehorning their way into the regiment through the only means possible, which was bugling. Um, so, and, and there were an awful lot of family groups, um, which is which is great for developing esprit de corps and teamwork and stuff, but obviously terrible when that battalion goes into action and, and villages and families lose all their family members in one in one fell swoop. Um, also, so, when, yeah. when my younger brother gave a talk on uh, First World War Cambridge to the society a while ago, he did mention Great Uncle Bob was taken out, and he what they were preparing to to bring sergeants up to officer ranks and there were courses in Cambridge and he started one of those because he was right. quite a yep. bright lad. Yeah, I mean, there were, there were a, quite a cohort of um, NCOs and sometimes privates who, who, um, who then went on to officer training. Yeah. And there, there, were, there were a lot of officer training units in Cambridge. So, yeah. so although 
although they often ended up in different regiments, it's very unusual to commission into your own regiment where you've served in the ranks, although it wasn't impossible. Um, lots of them went through the officer training corps run by the university and then off to other regiments. So yeah, yeah, anyone, anyone who had survived up to that point, and especially those decorated for gallantry, were were regarded as potential officer material, and, and I think quite rightly. So they'd lost so many officers, they were doing this, but then again, the end of it was towards the end of the war, so it didn't actually happen. It's true. The rate of attrition in officers was extremely high. And certainly in the Cambridge Regiment, where the officers really did tend to leave from the front, and that exposes them terribly. So uh, yes. that's, that's the cause of that. Yeah, thank you. That was very interesting. Pleasure. OK, do we have any other questions? Um, please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask if you have anything you'd like to say. Hey. OK, well, I think that's probably uh, probably time to call it. Oh, no, one more from Caro. Well, Simon, I just want to say thank you on behalf of the Mill Road History Society, actually to both Robins, because if Robin Mansfield hadn't introduced us to you, Robin James, this wouldn't have happened. And it really has been a very moving evening as, as well as a very informative one. So thank you very much from the committee. My absolute pleasure. Please do come and have a look at the website if, you, if you're interested in the local infantry regiment. We're, we're intending to expand it to a research trust and cover the regiment's history from start to finish rather than the First World War, but please do come and have a look. Thank you. Thank you for having me. The website address up earlier, Robin. Yes. Do you want me to send you it, Simon? Is that, would that be useful? Uh, Ash, I think you, you, put, you sent me, is that the one you sent originally with the, with the images, I think? Quite probably. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll put it into the next newsletter anyway, just to make sure you've got it. And I'll put it up along with the, uh, the YouTube video when that goes up at the weekend. So, okay. Hey, so, could I just say what's coming up? Yeah, oh yes, sorry, yes. <laughs> uh, we have a talk on Tuesday the 12th of April. 7.30 to 9.00 p.m. It's at the Ross Street Community Centre um, and it's called Secrets Never to be Told. Fiona Chesterton's recently published book tells of an extraordinary story of two women, herself and a cousin, that takes us from Victorian Cambridge to Vancouver as family secrets are revealed. So that sounds jolly interesting, doesn't it? Oh, there's also another one. It's part of the uh, Cambridge Festival. Uh, it's called Best Foot Forward, from Arbury to Romsey, with many stops along the way. Um, and this is the Mill Road Baptist Church on the 29th of March, uh, as part of Cambridge Festival 2022. Mill Road History Society presents an alternative tour of Cambridge through time and place. And uh, the uh, the person doing the the uh, rather Kay. program is Kay Blaney. So uh, look at the Mill Road History Society website site for more information. Thanks, yes, just, just thank you, Robin. Uh, just to say that the um, uh, the, the Cambridge Festival uh, item they just mentioned is actually currently full um, because we had to we had to make that ticketed because it's part of the festival. So uh, that, those are all gone now. Although some may become available closer to the time if others drop out um but uh yes the uh the other event will be our first um one back in real life at ross street uh so uh well we hope to see see some of you there and hopefully nothing bad will happen uh between now and then that causes us to, to go back onto zoom uh we will be attempting to film our uh, uh in real life uh meetings um so that they can join the uh, uh the archive on on youtube but that we'll just have to see how that one goes. Um, OK, uh, so was there any last comments? From, I saw a couple of people unmute themselves. Did anyone have any, any last um, comments they wanted to make? Oh, Simon, it's Helen here. Hello, um, hi, I was just going to say I'm I've got a talk as part of the um, festival oh, and sure. it's, a, it's a walking tour. I'll send you a notes you can put it into your next mini newsletter and it's a free talk that walks around the neighborhood it starts at three o'clock on sunday the third of april and an easy venue to find the lovely victorian free library on mill road on what's now headley street so it's going to tell the story of the headley ironworks 
and walk people through what's the new development. So it's a short walk between the public library on Mill Road and it'll take you through the development and then back down the back streets down to the Geldart where the talk ends. So it's a 90 minute free walking tour and three o'clock to 4.30 p.m. and everybody's welcome. It's not got a capped number on it, so you can just show up and weather dependent. Hopefully everyone will be able to join in the talk and, and walk around the neighborhood with me. Great, yep, yeah, send us the details and I'll put that into a newsletter beforehand so that everyone can see. Okay, right. I think now we'll definitely finally wrap up. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Robin, uh, for your talk. And uh, we hope to see you all uh, in person at a, an upcoming event. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.